This passage we have just read um, has four principal actors. If we went along with the reading, firstly, the first actor and the principal actor is God. Secondly, we were told about Samuel. Then we also had his sons, Joel and Abia. Then lastly, the Israelites. And um, if we read the first verse, it says, And it came to pass when Samuel was whole, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Um, before I go further, I'd just like to quickly define what a judge or who a judge is. Um, in simple words, a judge was somebody um, in those days who arbitrated over disputes and over contentions with, uh, between two people or between cities and and um, these disputes were usually brought to such a judge and he had the sole discretion in deciding how that dispute was resolved. And um, the history of judges actually started in the book of Exodus 18, 13 to 26. Somebody should quickly please open to Exodus 18, 13 to 26. Um, Moses, as we find out, there was the first judge. Yes, ma'am. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening. Unto evening. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God, when they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one another, and I do make them know the status of God and his law. Thank you. So we see that like a judge is somebody like the people who always came on to. When they had matters, when they wanted to inquire about God, or when they needed guardians about any certain issue, they went on to the judge. And um, the first judge was Moses in the life of the history of the Israelites. Before that time, they did not essentially have a judge. And Jethro, uh, Moses' father-in-law, so that um, the work was too much for Moses in leading the children of Israel um, to come out of Egypt. And he advised them then that like, he should appoint judges over the children of Israel. And these judges were chosen from the elders of the 12 tribes of Israel. So in essence, every tribe had a judge and um, these people in their tribes went to their judges to settle disputes, to settle matters, and Moses was the overall judge. So that's essentially the history of judges. So if we go back to First Samuel chapter eight verse one, it says, "When and it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of the second was Abia. They were judges in Beersheba. Beersheba was um, on the southern part of Israel. Samuel essentially did not relinquish the position of a judge. He was still essentially the supreme judge, but he appointed his children as um, co-judges." You know, um, and they were to assist him in judging the people in the southern part of Israel at that time, which was Beersheba. The first son's name was Joel, and the second was Abia. And we have in verse 3 that it says, His sons walked not in the ways, but turned aside after Luca. Luca um, is the Old Testament um, name for money. It's what we call money this day. And two bribes and perverted judgment. And that is actually. Like a sad thing, you know. Before, before um, Joel and Abia, there had been other judges who who did the right thing alongside Samuel too. There was Gideon, there was Eli who called Samuel, there was Deborah, and there was Samson. All these people actually followed God and did the right thing. But unfortunately, the children of um, Samuel, Joel and Abia, did not do the right thing. And this this is rather interesting because. Their father was supposed to be a man of God. He was, he was a judge, he was a prophet. And I want to believe someone must have brought them up correctly, must have shown them the way of the Lord. But unfortunately, the Bible says they chose not to go after the way of their fathers. They did things which their own father did not do, or which people before them did not do. And if we quickly see, the, the Bible says they collected bribes and they went after a filthy looker. Now, this is interesting because um, even though these children were named after God, they had a godly heritage. Joel means Jehovah is God. Abia means God is a father. 
they choose not to fear God, they choose not to to do what is expected of them. And that was not very good. Now let's uh, quickly move on to Proverbs 1 6. Why don't you please open quickly to Proverbs 1 6? I'm trying to underscore that um, as parents, even though God has given us the responsibility to. To understand a proverb. Yes, ma'am. To understand a proverb and the interpretation. The verse, six. The verse 6. Verse 6 alone. Verse 6. Yes. Yeah. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the word of the wise. And they have dark sayings. Um, well, what the first I'm trying to say was like where it says we should bring up our, our children in the way of the Lord and raise them and like they would not turn away from it. So even though some of brought up these children in the way of the Lord, they raised them in the way of the Lord, they did not go after that way. And as parents, even though we have the responsibility to bring up these children, the best we can do is to tell them what is right. Lead, lead, lead them by example, show them how they should go. But unfortunately, I dare say we do, we are not responsible for how they turn out entirely. Sometimes children still decide to um, go in their own ways. And as children for the youth in the church, even though our parents have brought us up and they've raised us, we have to repent ourselves. The Yoruba proverb says, please permit me to use this proverb like Baba Bini, Aturenibi. So even though our parents are godly people, this godliness cannot be transmitted unto us. It is not inherited. We still have to follow God for ourselves. We still have to seek God for ourselves and learn to do the right thing. Then verse 3, it, it says they collected bribes and they took after Luca. Um, we would see that God had already told them expression in the book of Exodus 23, 7-8. Quickly please. Exodus 23, 7-8. Then another person should open to Deuteronomy 16, 19. Keep thee far from a false matter, okay. and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked, and thou shalt take with no peace. Yeah. For the gift blinded the wise, and perverted the words of the righteous. Thank you. God had already warned judges that would be against collecting bribes against doing the wrong thing because he, he had said that like collecting bribe would perfect judgment and it will turn it will turn them away from doing what is right. If somebody were to bring a matter before me and I'm supposed to be a judge and I'm taking bribe from that person, because of that bribe, I will be constrained to judge in the person's favor, even though I know that it is contrary to what God would want me to do. So God had warned them that like he did not want bribes, he did not like bribes. Then did you know me um 16, 19, who is that person? Do not pervert, do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept the bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. So God had told them also in 16, 19 that they were not to collect bribe and they were not to pervert just, justice, but these children did that. Now, the elders of um, Israel now went on to Samuel and said, they didn't want these judges anymore because they had done wrong, they were doing the wrong things and they were collecting bribes. They were justified in asking for these judges to be impeached. But we need to understand that their, their grievance was not exactly against the children, Joel and Abia. Their major target was Samuel himself. Because Samuel, like I said, was still the supreme judge. Abia and Joel were only supportive judges. So. As we find out, like in many instances in the Bible, when they rebelled against Moses, now against my, um, Samuel, they were rebelling essentially against Samuel. They did not want Samuel to be a judge. And by extension, they were also rebelling against God because it was God that imposed Samuel on them. God gave them Samuel. So they said they didn't want this um, judge anymore. And they now asked him that like, he should give them a king that would be unto them like other nations. And this is where they act very greatly because in asking for a king, even though they had um, a reason to, they were justified because Joel and Abia had done wrong and they were perverting justice. They asked for a king contrary to God's will. And that is the focal matter in this passage.
passage we are reading, we are studying. Now, there's a difference between a judge and a king. I will say that very shortly. God gave them judges, like we underscored. The judge was was more like them. A judge was one of them. A judge was not exalted above them. A judge was not living in a palace. A judge was not demanding um, tithes and whatever of them. But they now asked Samuel so like they wanted a king. They did not want Samuel anymore. They didn't want his children. They didn't want God's way anymore. They wanted a king. And what was their reason for wanting a king? Their motive for wanting a king? He said, so that will be asked unto other nations. If you remember, the children of Israel never essentially forgot Egypt where they were coming from. They, they still always more or less look back into Egypt. This is the people that like um, God delivered, God brought out from Egypt, took them over the Red Sea, led them by a pillar of cloud and all of that, but they still essentially always look back into Egypt. Um, in, the, in the passage it says they, 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 they remembered the onions, the lettuce and everything they were eating in Egypt. They still wanted to be under bondage in court when God more or less had freed them and given them a liberal system by giving them a judge. So they wanted a king. And as we go ahead, we see that like God already now warned them that like if they had this king, it will not go well with them. It says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. And one other thing I want us to learn here is when Samuel had this issue, when they came to meet him and they said they wanted the king, he says, but they didn't displease Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And what did Samuel do? What was Samuel's reaction? And this is something we should all learn from. When we have issues that confront us, the first thing we should do is to go to God and cry unto God. So Samuel took the matter to God and said, God, these people you have given me, they are asking for a king. This is not what you want, but they are asking for a king. And God said, leave them. Let them have a king. But God sternly warned them from verses 7 to um, 17. God warned them about what the implications of having a king, the implications of having their own way, that the king will oppress them, the king will take from their sheep, the king will make them slaves, they will cook in his kitchen, and all of that, and all of that. But surprisingly, and to my dismay, he says that like in verse 18, um, nevertheless, God wanted that in verse 18. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. God warned them that like, there's going to be there will be, be, be grievous um, implications for asking for a king. But sadly, in verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. They wanted a king because um, at this point, they were about to go into battle. Samuel at first led them you know, into a battle with their enemies. Remember the story of Ebenezer. It was shortly after this that these people now still wanted the king to lead them in, in battle, just like the other cities. They had forgotten that like, um, the judge, Samuel, appointed by God, was the advocate between them and God. And any time they had battles, Samuel or whoever the judge was went before God, and God always gave them victory. But yet, they wanted the king that would lead them in battle because the other nations were doing it. So it was essentially a question of motives and their heart, the situation in their heart. They were, they were more or less like what we call copycats. They wanted to belong, so to say. And it did not augur well for them. Verse 20. And it says that we may also be like other nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And that is where um, we really should concentrate on because. This passage is essentially all telling us about the dire consequences of deviating from the will of the Almighty God. We ought to all learn to remain and stay under the will of God, even when it is not convenient, even when it seems like it is not palatable, when it seems like it is not pleasant, because that is where God has chosen for us to be. That is what God wants for us. He says His ways are not our ways, His thoughts are not our thoughts. And um, oftentimes, even in our lives, even in my personal life, I ask God, God, why these things, why are things happening this way? But many times God will remind me that like that is his will, that is what he wants, and we have to learn to subject ourselves to God's will. Because that is that is what God wants for us, and that is what is best for us. But these people wanted the king, they wanted to go against God, and they actually strayed. And in the end it says, and the Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voices and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. 
It is a terrible thing when God more or less abandons us to our own choices, to our own will. When we tell God, ah, no, female, let me do it my own way. Just sometimes, like as parents, I'll, I'll quickly use this analogy of my, my second child, my daughter. Like um, when she was about two, by any time Nepal takes light and we put on the candle, she usually always was attracted to the light, would always want to touch it and say, Don't do that, don't do that. The mother will shout, Don't do that, don't do that. But she always wanted to do it, she always wanted to do it, and the mother was always exasperated. So one day I told her, See, leave her. Let's let her do it for the first time. So she went with her walker and all of that, and she touched it and it burnt her. And trust me, after that day, if she sees any light at all, she will never go near it. So just like that, sometimes God leaves us to our own way, and the consequences are always there. They are always unpleasant. Just like my daughter got burnt, we usually will get burnt if we choose to go contrary to God's will. And, um, you know, God reigns in the affairs of men. God is the supreme king. God is the, the overall king. He's the king of kings. These people yet were not satisfied with that. They wanted their own way. And we should not do that as children of God. We should always stay under God's will, no matter how um, unpleasant it seems. We should, we should always watch and pray. You know, um, the children of Samuel, they were brought up by their father. They were men of God in court. They were, they were supposed to be spirit-filled. They, they were qualified to be judges, but they actually lost it along the way. And the book of uh, Mark 14, verse 38, come on, please. Mark 14, 38. Ephesians 6, 18. And another person should open up to Luke 12, 15. Have you not read 
so much as theirs, what David did when himself was an hungry, and they and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God and did take and eat the shoe bread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord, also the Sabbath. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there were a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would kill on the Sabbath day, and they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thought and said to the man, which are the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he rose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. And is, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored, whole as the order. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another, what they might do to Jesus. And it came to pass... Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, as we see, this this um, other side of the sermon is about the controversy of the Sabbath. And it has a lot of similarities with the first passage we just read. The actors in this, um, the key point here are one, the Sabbath, the disciples of Jesus, Jesus himself, and the Pharisees. Just like Samuel was their principal target in that first passage. Their issue was not exactly against Joel and Abia. That was just a, a, a coin. That was just an alibi to get at Samuel. The disciples of Jesus had also, on the Sabbath, they gone through a field of corn and they were eating corn from the ears of the corn on the Sabbath. At this time, I want us to understand that like, the Pharisees were not exactly after the disciples of Jesus, but they were after Jesus himself just like the Israelites were after Samuel. And if we want to understand this further, we'll be open to Deuteronomy 23-25. Book of Deuteronomy 23-25. When thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou bearest blood the ear with thy hand, but thou shalt not move a city unto thy neighbor's standing son. Thank you. So, God had already given an injunction that like people could go into people's fields and eat corn if they are hungry. They could pluck it with their hands, but they should not use a sickle. In, in essence, they should not use an instrument to harvest it. So, the disciples of Jesus were not stealing. They were not stealing corn. They were only eating corn because they were hungry. But unfortunately, this act was done on the Sabbath. And the detractors of Jesus, people who had been watching Jesus and wanted to bring him down, just like they wanted to bring Samuel down, went after him and said, Ah, why are your disciples doing this on the Sabbath day? And for us all to, I want us to understand that people will always watch us. As Christians, as, as, as workers in our respective places of work, there are people who are always looking for our downfall. If we deceive ourselves, they're like, Nobody sees us, nobody actually cares about us, we'll be fooling ourselves. People actually want us to like fall. People don't want us to like do well. How is it coincidental that like when Jesus and his disciples were walking through the, the field on a Sabbath day, when the Pharisees themselves should either be in the temple or somewhere doing what they should do, it was Jesus they were following and they went and they said, ah, see what your disciples are doing on the Sabbath day. And just like in the first lesson, Essentially, it is the motive we should be looking at here. It is the heart. They were not the Pharisees. The Pharisees are, um, they are like um, Bible scholars. They are people that know, know the word, in quote, know the scriptures. And, and they, are, they are what we can call the fanatics of today. They take religion to an extreme. And God is not essentially concerned about religion. God is concerned about our hearts. How we follow him, how we serve him. And these Pharisees were not essentially fighting for the cause of God when they went to Jesus and said, Ah, see what the disciples are doing on the Sabbath day. They were actually antagonizing Jesus and they wanted to bring him down. 
God was not their motive. God was not in their hearts when they said this. Because otherwise, if you understand what was actually wrong about um, eating corn on the cornfield on the Sabbath day, when you are hungry, when even the, the book of the Jeremiah has said that was okay. But their target was Jesus. And when anytime we are confronted with um, our antagonists and people that want to bring us down, just like Jesus, we should pray for wisdom from God to be able to answer them correctly. You know, the Bible says we should be wise as serpents, yet tame as those. Jesus did not tell them, why are you to ask me these questions? And you know, Jesus was not confrontational. Just like Samuel himself too was not confrontational when they came to meet him and they wanted to depose him. You know, Samuel rather went to God. You know, So we, we should borrow from these people and when people confront us, when people antagonize us, we should be calm and by the Spirit of God, we should be able to give them answers that will confound them. Jesus at that point did not abolish the Sabbath and he did not say, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is not necessary. Uh, what do you mean? And all of that. He didn't say, I am God. You are all of that. But Jesus told them why they are the answer them. They're like, you are all hypocrites. Because that's what they truly were. And if we if we, if we, if we look at other passages in the Bible, and time may not exactly permit us, God asked them, Jesus asked them, like, how many of you will have your, your sheep fall down into a pit on the Sabbath day and will not rescue it? And they would not say anything. And as you know, just like for all of us, if our sheep or our ox falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, I'm sure we'll go into the ditch to remove it. But these um, Pharisees, they don't want disciples of Jesus to feed themselves when they were hungry. And if we go further, we'll see that, like, also Jesus went on to heal on the Sabbath day, Jesus went ahead doing good. And Jesus already knew he was being watched, he knew. His detractors were after him, and he deliberately healed that man on the Sabbath day because he wanted to prove the point. And he says he wanted them to know that the, the Son of Man was the Lord of the Sabbath. And this is a very interesting thing because if we really understand what the Sabbath is, then we would appreciate what Jesus was doing and what Jesus was saying. The Sabbath was um, essentially an injunction from God. It was the seventh day after God rested from making making the world that God, God directed that the children of Israel also rest on the seventh day. And he goes on to say that like the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That is a very pregnant um, statement. But we need to understand that the Sabbath was made for us. The Sabbath was made to to admonish us, to, to fulfill things in our lives. And it's not the other way around. On the Sabbath, we are meant to rest and we are meant to devote that day to God and focus on God, worship God and do good. So there's nothing necessarily wrong about doing good on the Sabbath. The, the principal issue here is our hearts should always be focused on God and it should not always be only on the Sabbath day. Every day of the week at every opportunity we should try to have a Sabbath in court daily so that we can always be focused on God and not focused on the things around us. And that is what the Sabbath is essentially about. And um, if we also remember that everything that happened in the Old Testament and in the New Testament like, was supposed to admonish us. If we go to the book of um, Hebrews 3, 8 to 19. Somebody should please open Hebrews 3, 8 to 19. Is anybody there? Yeah. 3, 8 to 19. That's all time. Okay. Have you not your hearts okay. as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, and in the wilderness? Go on, man. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, whereof I was free that generation and said they do always hear in their hearts and they have not known my ways so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest take heed brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God but exhort 
one another daily, why it is called today. Lest any of you be added through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our covenant steadfast unto the end, why it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, adding not your heart as in the provocation. For some, when they are dead, do provoke. How bait not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had seen? Whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. Thank you. So we see uh, this this passage underscores the true lesson. Um, Paul was trying to admonish the Israelites that they should not fall as in the day of the provocation and um, when the Israelites fell in the wilderness. And they fell because of the hardness in their heart and their unbelief. So even though today God has said that there is still a Sabbath. Even though we, we celebrate Sabbath every Sunday, there is still a, a coming Sabbath for the children of God. The Sabbath when we would all, we would all go to live with God in heaven after we've, 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 we've exited this earth. That Sabbath is still coming. And just like the children of Israel fell in the wilderness in those days because they provoked God with their unbelief and their hardness in their heart, God is warning us here that like the, the real Sabbath, the ultimate Sabbath is still coming and that we as as believers should always continue to believe we should always continue to persevere and stand fast till the end so that we would not fall like they fell many of them did not enter into the rest of god the, the, the canaan that god promised them because they had unrest in their heart and they did not want the ways of god they did not want to live under the will of god god is warning us and admonishing us here that like for us to enter into that rest that that ultimate that glorious sabbath that is coming that we need to continue to believe. It's not just believe today and not believe tomorrow. It's not be steadfast today and not be steadfast tomorrow. We have to be steadfast at all times. We have to take it unto ourselves. We have to always watch and pray and ensure that at every point in time, our hearts are right with God. It is not what we do or what we say essentially that is the key thing. Like, you know, sometimes we, we are right to ask God for things. God, I want this. God, I want that. But many times we should examine our motives. Why do I want these things? Why do I want to do these things? So God will help us all and Amen. as we all um, imbibe all these teachings. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let us clap for Jesus.